This contains soap. How does someone look at soap and go, we can eat that? Thousands of people pass through Dubai every day in transit towards their final destinations. I, for one, have landed here more times than I can count in between flights from and to Asia or Europe. However, I never really took the time to explore the city aside from the flashy CBD for a quick drink years back. I was just wrapping up a shoot in Kyrgyzstan when I realized last minute that we would have to wait 10 hours to board our next flight to Manila. I'm sure that this is a situation that happens to a lot of people and I thought that it might be good to put together a food crawl which travelers can use in the city, whether they are staying for 3 hours or 10 hours like us. Or maybe we can shine a light on a side of Dubai most people don't necessarily see in the in-flight information, on TV, or in magazines. We're gonna eat our way through most of the dishes that you would want to try if you're here in Dubai. Okay, so we're going to Al Riga metro station. Why, why are you laughing? <laughs> why are you laughing already? I love the beans. We wanted to get a feel for the older Dubai, where the buildings look normal, not hyped up on steroids, and from where most of the entrepreneurial spirit of the continuously evolving metropolis started. It's not far from the airport and provides a variety of things to do, from the old city souks to small shops, cafes, and a heaping number of restaurants, all strewn around narrow streets. As we knew nothing about the city, and since we didn't have much time to prepare for the episode, we were lucky enough to find out about Frying Pan Adventures. They focus on food tourism with a penchant for authenticity, history, and culture. We met up with Nala and embarked on our Middle Eastern food pilgrimage. For our first bite, we chose Fetir, an Egyptian hand-tossed pie where the dough is stretched until it's paper thin, filled with basturma, beef pastrami, which in Egypt is spiced with cumin, garlic, salt, and pepper, rumi, an aged Egyptian cheese, and vegetables. It is then folded back together and put in a pizza oven. It does indeed have a kick. Very good though. So it really, for, for lack of a better word, it really does feel kind of like a pizza, but just with a lighter dough, filo pastry, um, flavors going on. Next was the filling dish called koshari. So yeah. this is a mix of so, chickpeas, rice, lentils, yeah, you saw it later, fried onions, so, okay. And it is a mashup of rice, macaroni, spaghetti, or vermicelli noodles, yeah. lentils, chickpeas, some salsa, fried onions. So this will energize us for the yeah. whole day. Lots of starch, lots of carb. Lots yeah. of starch, lots of carb. Um, no meat, kind of budget friendly, almost like Got a it. pantry put together type meal. After, after all those noodles after and rice, yeah, you'll you'll need a little bit of cumin to make you de-bloat. That's so interesting. It's really like what was left in the pantry, put it all together, but it actually it doesn't taste like there's so many things happening. It does it does really have kind of like that one flavor, which is really comforting. Yeah, exactly. It's comforting. It's mm. it's very easy to assemble and hugely popular. While walking towards our next stop, a traditional sweets restaurant where we could sample some coffee and pastries, I wondered about what exactly comprises the food culture of Dubai. So, food of the indigenous tribes of Dubai would really be inspired and influenced by, you know, the need to preserve. From that, it kind of transitioned into being spiced with flavors from India and Iran. Okay. Yeah, so think large dishes, sustaining dishes, quite fatty, um, not many vegetables or fresh produce available. And so this, how does this fit in? This place has many functions. What you can see around you are these very ornate dishes, right? So if you're visiting somebody from the Middle East, you want to bring over a gift, what you would do is buy one of those plates, fill it up with baklava and take it to this guest. This, for example, is a cookie called a karabish, and it is stuffed with pistachios. And the best way to eat it is actually with this cream over here, which I'd like you to have a guess 
as to what goes into it, but what you would do is give it a really nice, generous Double. dip, and you stick that in your mouth. Okay. Yeah. All right, so this is, um, I guess, a butter-based pastry? Yeah. Okay. Rose? No. Yes? Yes, it okay. can contain rose. So this contains soap. Ah, so this is the soap. Mm -hmm. How does someone look at soap and go, we can eat that? What I can tell you is this. It's the root of the soap quartz plant. Okay. It is called Bois de Panama as well. In Arabic, it's called Shirsh al Halawa, which means like sweet root. Mm -hmm. So there must have been this association with the fact that maybe it was fragrant or sweet, but it was always used as a shampoo, soap, laundry detergent, and Persian carpet cleaner. Wow. How it made its way into this, we're not entirely sure. It's like sure. the Greek hummus, it can fix everything. Too wow. much of it can actually give you a dull ache in your ears, your throat, your nose. I'm a hypochondriac. So okay, similar to what would happen. This, I'm yeah, it. similar <laughs> to what would happen if you like swallowed a bit of soap or Got it. shampoo. So this is my mul mud. Uh, this is something we're going to have with our coffee now. Arabic coffee has a lot of etiquette to it. Firstly, it's the fact that it always needs to be poured with the left and served with the right. The less that's being poured, the friendlier your host is or the more your host wants to spend time with you. Because the idea is that I will want to share many cups with you. To accompany the spiced Arabic coffee, we had Manmul Hamad, a date bar, and my personal favorite, a selection of different styles of baklava. I would say that one's my favorite. Yeah. This is really nice. We need to keep these away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I these know are the type of things that I can just keep eating. I know. And I'm already learning so much in terms of the culture and everything. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I was coming here to see Salt Bay or something, making steak. <laughs> A quick sugar rush and a jolt down the street later, we headed towards a Palestinian restaurant. We came here for the moussakan, not to be confused with moussaka. This is the national dish of Palestine and a great way to test out the quality of the olive oil they produce. It's made with chicken, caramelized onions, sumac, pine nuts, and almonds. The dish sits on tabun flatbread and is loaded with olive oil. Paired with minty yogurt, the chicken is crispy on the outside yet tender, and it's best eaten with your hands. This is really tasty. Yeah, and then the yogurt has mint and cucumbers. What I love is the sumac really comes through, but extremely subtly. It's just really back there. And you're right, the bread does get all that flavor. We were then invited into the kitchen to watch how kunafa is made, a dish I wouldn't have been able to understand had I not seen it being prepared. A festive dessert that is eaten whenever there is good news abound. It's made from kataifi noodles, nabulsi cheese, oil, and tons of sugar syrup. Abu Ahmar has been making this dish for 20 years, from Egypt to Jordan, and now in Dubai. Wow, I didn't expect that at all. But, I, well, I can taste the butter. I don't know. You need to try it, one. <laughs> you need to try it. <laughs> try this piece. Try this piece. Try it, it's really good. We obviously couldn't leave Dubai without trying a shawarma. So avoiding a possible online revolt, even though I could only fathom a few bites, we followed our noses and quickly found our vendor. In Ottoman invention, the word shawarma derives from the Turkish sevirme, which means to turn. The meat slabs are spiced, layered vertically on a spit, and slowly roasted. The chicken shawarma was paired with thum, a garlic aioli, and pickles. The beef shawarma had some red onions, parsley, tomatoes, and tahini. Both were delicious. I think that kind of thing where you customize it does come from the fast food places that we know more of in Europe. And so the late night places, because over here it's going to be a no frills thing, like you would almost not specify. You just say meat or chicken and they go with it. Yeah. I feel like that's a perfect final bite. Like, and definitely it's a side that I don't think a lot of people get yeah. to see. Because when you when you research it, you always end up yeah. going to the same places yeah, or seeing yeah, the same yeah. thing. So this is really special and, yeah. and a huge eye-opener. And you know, we've met people from Egypt, across to Lebanon, uh, Palestine. We're here in like a Syrian uh, restaurant as well. And yeah, all this happens on one street, nice. which is very inspiring. You might have noticed something. The only thing we didn't have was local Emirati food. 
It usually features nomadic dishes. See large meat dishes, slow cooked, served in milk, dates, and bread. You'll then find dishes influenced with Indian spices due to the ancient trade routes. The servings are quite big, which is why we opted to try lots of smaller dishes from the region rather than some large ones during our short layover. So whether you're looking for something more traditional or more modern, Dubai has a little bit of everything for everyone. I definitely do need to come back to explore more of it. I'm all showered now, ready to go. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time.